Um, good day again, this is Professor Resnick. Um, today I want to uh, pick up on our discussion last time of Richard Rorty, um, and I want to talk uh, more on epistemology and how that connects uh, to Marxism, the focus of this course. First, consider Marxism as a kind of conceptual object. There are physical objects like this lectern, an automobile, and so forth, but consider a conceptual object, different adjective. Um, and the question there is, how do we figure out um, what it is? So how do we figure out this object, conceptual Marxism, that we're going to study in this particular course? And there are two traditional answers to this question within the study of epistemology. First, n notice that the conceptual object, Marxism, is assumed to be independent of us. It's out there in the uh, syllabus that I've asked you to, to uh, read. It's out there in these brief lectures that I'm presenting to you. It's there in capital, the book by Marx that we're going to read. So one answer to the question of what is conceptual, uh, what is this conceptual object, Marxism, is to read it read the stuff on the syllabus, read the book, and then via the mind, your mind, induce the truth of what it's all about. So in this approach, reading experience, the experience of reading, is the standard of truth. That's called empiricism. Okay? So the answer to the question of what is Marxism, which again is assumed to be independent of us, is experience in order to induce the truth of that conceptual object. Let me give you a different answer to the question. Uh, let me begin with an attack actually on the first answer that I just provided. <clears throat> you can read the book, you can read everything on that reading list, you can listen to these lectures and you're not going to figure it out. What you need, according to the second view, is a key set of ideas to allow you to sort through um, all those readings. The readings are going to provide you with an infinity of different facts. But in fact, the way you will sort through those to figure out what are valid, what are not, and so forth, is the, through a sorting mechanism, which is your mind. So the second way um, argues that there are certain key ideas, or, or if you want a logic of, of reasoning, which will enable you to figure out what this uh, Marxism is, is, is all about. The reason, then, reason is the standard of truth in the second way, that's rationalism. Just where the word comes from, rationalism, reason is the standard of truth in the second way. So we have two different standards of truth with which and by which we can figure out what is this conceptual object. So I want to critically examine now these two different ways um, of gaining knowledge, these two different, different epistemologies and compare and contrast them with uh, this Marxist way uh, which I said last time, this notion of dialectic materialism, dialectical materialism or overdetermination. Suppose someone produces then a knowledge of Marxism in a book or an article or in these lectures, uh, whatever the form, it, it arrives uh, in front of you, you have a conceptual object. Um, in general, let's extend that. Someone can produce a knowledge of anything in life. Um, a knowledge of the planet Earth, a knowledge of the, of, of the stars, a knowledge of the universe, a knowledge of this lectern comprised of particles, um, a knowledge of two people uh, 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 dancing um, in a dance hall. That's not an epistem epistemological problem. The production of knowledge is not the problem. The epistemological problem arrives when the individual or the collectivities of individuals assert that their produced uh, knowledge of Marxism or the planet Earth or whatever is the truth for all potential knowers. When that happens, with that, that, that particular moment, when, when the knower or the community of knowers asserts that that particular conceptual object is the truth for, ev for, for everyone, then by virtue of what the truth is, in terms of what we talked about before, then truth has to be independent of that particular Noah who has made that assertion, and everybody else who, who hears it, thinks about it. So the independence 
is another way of saying that that particular knowledge has a prior existence. If it's the truth, it doesn't depend upon anybody else's production of it, but it had an independent existence prior to that particular Noah or, or anybody else's uh, knowledge of it. And hence, that's what given to us means. So that crucial first step of independence, that which is given to us, can only be given if it's independent of us, is what the rationalists and the empiricists are, are doing in order to transform their particular claim about the world, or their particular truth claim, into the world itself. So if you assert that your particular uh, knowledge of Marxism is the truth, then it can't be relative, that truth can't be relative to your production of it or anyone else. Rather, it was always out there to be discovered or revealed to you and to other people. And the question becomes, well, how, do, how was it discovered and how was it was revealed? Then we go back to what we said before. Rationalism discovers it via thought. The empiricist discovers it uh, via experience. So if it has a prior existence, it's the tr no, let, me, let me back up. If it's, a, if it's the truth, or claimed to be the truth, it has a prior existence, like as I said before, like a mountain or, or, or um, you know, a, a, a continent. And then the way you discover the mountain or continent, according to the rationalists, is via reason, according to the empiricists, um, according to uh, experience, the reading experience. Okay, and those are the two, two standards that these two different kinds of epistemologies have offered, have offered us. Well, what have they done? They have taken these two, although they do it in different ways, but it, they, have, they take, the rationalists and the empiricists, the empiricists take in common their particular ideas of the world and transform them into the world. Then they compare everybody else's thinking about the world against their particular thoughts, which they've turned into the world, to see if everybody else's ideas are correct. So they have transformed their particular theory about the world into the world, and that, that's a kind of epistemological labeling which enables their ideas about the world to become the world. So their conceptual <coughs> object, in this case Marxism, has been transformed into the true discourse, the true theory of the world, then everybody, the privileged Marxism, then all of the Marxisms are compared and contrasted against it to see if they measure up. There is a, that I mentioned, is, I mentioned his name to you before, there is a French philosopher, uh, unfortunately passed away a few years ago, Foucault, F-O-U-C-A-U-L-T, Michel Foucault, who claimed that power was used by the few to transform their ideas about the world into the truth, into the world, and then all other ideas had to conform to it. So we need to keep in mind Foucault's lesson. What still is and forevermore will remain merely a truth claim about the world, produced by an individual or by a community of individuals, is used as a club forcing everybody else's ideas in society to conform to those set of ideas. Their ruling ideas become our, our ideas, not because they're true, but rather because they assert that their ideas are not theirs, <laughs> but rather they belong to the world. And the way they do that is through that rationalist, empiricist trickery. So. What we have to do as individuals is to, to uh, resist this kind of trickery, this epistemological trickery, and not allow their ideas to become our ideas, that is to control our behavior. That's what Marxism is, is uh, struggling against, or, or, or let me put it more accurately, that's what Marxist epistemology is struggling against. Non-Marxian discourses of the day, of Marx's day and today, claim that their particular theory of the world is in fact the truth. They have, they have discovered, whether it be neoclassical economic theory or Keynesian theory, they have discovered an absolute singular truth, which is no ex class exploitation exists. So Marxism, 
or Marxist epistemology attacks that kind of epistemological claim of non-Marxian economic theory by showing that no, it's not an absolute singular truth, no class exploitation, rather that's a relative truth claim relative to neoclassical and economic theory and it's merely another claim about the world and Marxism is a theory that produces a different claim and so we have a struggle in theory between these two different claims about the world. Neither one of them is absolutely true. They're truth claims and they could be interrogated and questioned, rejected, accepted, hated and loved just like anything else in the world. So from a dialectical perspective a truth about the world, whether it be within Marxism or physics or whatever else, is just another claim about the world. And like all other claims, it is socially produced. Hence, again, very important, it can be questioned, it can be rejected, it can be accepted, it can be loved, it can be hated, just like any other entity in the world. And if one rejects a particular uh, claim about the world, one is not rejecting the truth. And hence one is not a dangerous or an idiot or stupid or whatever. Crawl crazy. Rather, one is rejecting an individual or group's claim about the world. That's not a minor thing, but that is what one is doing. And one is not then transformed into a, a fool by rejecting someone else's claim about the world. What we have to be aware of is how rationalism and empiricism engage in this kind of illusion, this epistemological illusion or trick or act of magic, which, they, which is, again, they, they take their uh, ideas about the world and somehow transform it into a fact of the world. We also need to remember one other thing in terms of rationalism and empiricism. These are theories of, of knowledge and one can always ask about each how do you know that your particular theory is true? Now, in other words, you can ask the rationalist, rationalist, how do you know your particular rationalist epistemology, epistemology, which is a theory, is correct? If the rationalist answers that I know that my uh, theory is correct based upon reason, well, you can say to the rationalist, that's circular reasoning. You haven't shown anything. You haven't proven a thing. What you've done is invoke your theory, your rationalist theory, in order to prove it. In other words, you're saying, in answer to the question that reason is a standard of truth on the base of my reason. Well, you're justifying reason on, on, on the basis of reason. You're assuming that's not proving anything, that's just kind of circular reasoning. Same thing goes for empiricism. How do you know your empiricist uh, uh, methodology, your empiricist theory is correct? If the empiricist answers, I know it to be correct based upon my experience, what that empiricist is doing is then is invoking the theory in order to prove the theory. That's as circular as is the rationalist. And of course, it's quite possible that an answer to this question, how do you know that your particular theory is true and valid, that the rationalist or the empiricist might fall into the other theory. That is, the rationalist theory might fall into empiricism, the empiricist might fall into rationalism, and you have an endless oscillation throughout the tradition of philosophy between uh, uh, rationalism falling into empiricism and empiricism falling into to rationalism. And I don't know of any way out of that kind of circularity. Um, uh, but if you do, um, you'll become very famous um, in philosophy. Finally, an important question arises. If we reject this attempt to find absolute singular truths, truths, are we left with an inability to make choices at all? In other words, when confronted with different truth claims about the world, how do we make choices? Or put this differently, do we not fall into a kind of nihilism when we are confronted with all, the, all of these different uh, truth claims? And I think the answer is no. One is not and cannot be rendered passive um, uh, in, uh, in confronting um, all these different uh, uh, contending truth claims about the world. And the reason is because we as individuals are all overdetermined sites. And one of our active responses to that 
overdetermination of us as individuals is the choices we make amongst everything in life, which includes these theories with which we are confronted. We prefer some over others, in part because of all the different political, economic, cultural, and natural processes which overdetermine us. Those different determina determinations yield our choices in life, including our choices over these theories. So we're never passive. We're always active participants in choosing one over the other. What Marx wanted us to experience and to be aware of and to think of was how his particular theory would affect our choices. In other words, he wanted to confront us with his particular truth claim with the hope that its determination, its effect upon us, might persuade us to incorporate his ideas into our way of thinking and, in, and into our way of, of seeing the world. Namely, to begin to think and to begin to see class exploitation in the world. That concludes this presentation.